where a lot of folks really struggle is they're like, I don't want to micromanage. Micromanage is like the dumbest word ever. Like, oh, you mean you don't want to manage? Got it. Totally. <laughs> right? Oh, you know what? I just like busted my ass for a year figuring out exactly the right order that these deals should go in and like what a, like what the discovery questions are and what the, the presentation script looks like and the slides look like and the demo script. But you know what? You just do you. You do you. Right? Like just, you know, just go crazy. No, that's like terrible. Pete Kazanji literally wrote the book on founder sales. He's our guest today on Grow and Tell, the show where revenue leaders tell the growth stories behind successful companies. I'm your host, Alex Krakoff. Grow and tell, grow and tell. After founding Honestly.com and TalentBin, which sold to Monster, Pete Kazanji has been sharing early stage sales advice with startup founders and early sales hires. He wrote Founding Sales, the startup sales handbook, and founded Modern Sales Pros, a community focused on sales leadership, sales operations, and sales enablement roles. Pete is also the co-founder of Atrium, a data platform that provides insights about sales team performance. Pete joined me today to share stories as a three-time company founder, including advice for hiring your initial sales team, why he co-founded Atrium, and the data revolution happening in sales right now. I hope you enjoy the chat. I'd love to start today's conversation talking about the early days of TalentBin. Can you kind of share the mm -hmm. story of Honestly.com and, and how that led you to start TalentBin? Honestly.com? Yeah. Um, well, I think the like a lot of um, early stage founders or like first time entrepreneurs, um, I think we had like a hypothesis that like wasn't like very pre-validated and, and to just to work, like remind folks it's like 2007 so like lean startup methodology and kind of what have you wasn't super um you know super well known and so we we had this hypothesis that you could solve the problem associated with um like reputation like portable reputation mainly for the hiring use case um using some of the mechanisms that uh, helped with um like reputation portability for um, businesses and services and what have you. So like you, like the Yelp metaphor, the Glassdoor metaphor or whatever. And so honestly.com was kind of like Glassdoor or Yelp um, with the intention of it being like community contributed reputation for individual professionals. Uh, ended up not working. Um, the funny thing was, is like wildly provocative and like people were just like freaked out and like Michael Arrington like had a, like he had like kittens and like, it was so funny. Like, just like all these like oh my god this thing it's going to be like you know a defamation machine or whatever what was hysterical was like all the press was like defaming us while like you know uh while while hypothesizing about this thing that actually never came to pass which was hysterical where it's like oh my god people are going to do all this stuff it's like no 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 actually no one's going to care at all and no one's actually going to ever write reviews because guess what writing reviews is hard and 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 so as like and so honestly.com just like died a death of of like no one cared um and like it was a, it was a failed hypothesis and so when, when we kind of like went back to the drawing board and we're like okay like what is the problem they were trying to solve for recruiters and what have you and did a bunch of customer interviews um what was actually funny was we did this um this like uh lean user experience um research that's called like luxy um with this woman uh janice i forgot her last name janice frazier and we were in the same class as there was um the guys from pull anywhere and the guys from zimride who were like trying to figure out like, yeah well pre-lift it was hysterical so it was a bunch of, it was like it was it was like pivots anonymous it was like all these people are like our thing's not working <laughs> like what should we do here it's like well like get back to it, it was super funny it's like get back to basics so what we started we did a bunch of customer interviews with recruiters and we're like hey like what's your big problem right now Oh, you know, um, finding um, finding technical talent and like specifically like their skill profile, like like are they a JavaScript person or are they a Java person? Are they an iOS person or what have you? Again, this was like ten years ago, so at the time LinkedIn had like really really big problems around um, information density on the profile. And then the second thing was like contact information, and we were like, oh, that's actually pretty interesting because like you have these data sources on the web, like you know Stack Overflow and Twitter and Meetup and GitHub and da 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 da. da. Like, hmm, I wonder if we could just like crawl those and create composite profiles of that and put that in a database that the recruiters could then search and. 
and then maybe, you know, find the email addresses associated with those candidates and, you know, put that into a database. And so like this notion of a composite profile, it's now very prevalent. There's companies like People Data Labs. And then also there's like, you know, sales companies like Apollo or like Zoom Info who do these things. But at the time, it wasn't really a very common thing. And so that's what we pivoted into. And that's where Talentbin came from. We got to a few million dollars of ARR before we were eventually acquired by Monster, um, but that's where it came from. And so you built this product for for technical recruiters to help them, and then you <laughs> realized you had to start doing sales. And you actually you wrote a whole book about uh, you know that process that I got right here. You know, shout out founding sales. But like <laughs> you know, the book was obviously written with a lot of hindsight. But like you had never done sales before. You had a product marketing background, like. What was that process like? How did you sort of figure out sales at Talentbit? Yeah, so I, um, early on, um, the good news was is that we ha- did a bunch of customer interviews. I, it should just be this like like flow process, right? Where um, we did a bunch of customer interviews to kind of unpack or like discover pain points. And then we kind of, kind of created some hypotheses around that and then, you know, piece together an MVP, so on and so forth. And then, and then took that MVP back out to, to some of the same people that we originally did interviews with. There's actually a really good uh, article on first round review called Get in the Van by Michael Sippy um, on customer interviews. And then it actually pairs really well with an article I wrote for first round review on customer advisory panels. Um, but the point is, is that like, you know, started like quickly realized like, hey, like this doesn't sell itself. Right. And this was also like really pre PLG and and what have you. But even like with PLG motions, what people f- quickly find is like PLG is like really great for um it's great for lead gen, but it's not great for closing. Right. And this is one of the things this is kind of like what one of the things that killed um killed Dropbox and another, you know, number of other organizations as well is um you know, one of the, the jokes I like to say is like, never mistake your lead gen as your business. Um, and so what we, what I quickly figured out, I was like, oh, someone's got to sell this thing, right? And so conveniently, um, we were a member of the first round capital portfolio. Um, first round capital, again, like 10 years ago, they were really ahead of the, um, they were really ahead of the curve when it came to facilitating community within the portfolio. Um, and so I was able to like learn sales or at least like kind of crib sales from a bunch of really great, um, founders, a gentleman named Sean Black, uh, who led inside sales at Trulia. He was the founder of a company called sales crunch, um, kind of like an early, um, like zoom plus like, you know, slide thing, um, that eventually was acquired by clear slide. So him, uh, Angus Davis, who is now a, a partner at, I want to say Foundation Capital, but he was like one of the founders at um, uh, Upserve and and before that, Tell Me. And so just kind of like learn from that, but also trial and error. Um, but I think the biggest thing was just like realizing like, hey man, like somebody's got to, somebody's got to do this. Somebody's got to interface with customers, got to ask them discovery questions, got to pr- like get them to open their eyes, present to them and persuade them to give this thing, give this thing a whirl. And that's kind of like, you know, that experience kind of taught me a couple of different things. Like one, you got to do this, this thing. Um, two, anyone can learn it. And like my back, as you noted earlier, my background's in product marketing and product management. Um, you know, I'm like, by, while not an engineer by background, like I'm a pretty left brain person and also a pretty, like at least historically was a pretty introverted person. And so just realizing like, there's a lot of false narratives out there about like born sellers and so on and so forth. And it's just like a muscle, right? Like it's just a muscle that you can learn and, and it just get, gets built over time if you do the do the push-ups. And so that's why I ended up writing Founding Sales was as like essentially like a textbook that goes from you know the very very beginnings um, all the way up through sales management and what have you and like I like to say that founding sales is like it's the sequel to like the lean startup but then the prequel to like predictable revenue or Jason Lemkin's um, Jason Lemkin's uh, predictable revenue to what is it called uh, uh, impossible to inevitable it's like for that in the middle like that zero to two million dollars where it's just like all right cool we have like a product like what do we do with this thing that's kind of where where like founding sales lives 
Yeah, no, that's an amazing book. And there's so much like amazing tactical advice in there. And I like I've referred to it many times and as I've been trying to figure out, um, you know, selling myself uh, at Doc. Well, that's um, that's why it's a yeah. website is, is because like the one of the big frustrations I've always had with books is that like they're monolithic and like the search experience within a book is like pretty miserable. Um, and so we just my my wife, God bless her. Um, put all of founding sales up on foundingsales.com. Like we hacked Squarespace to be like a booty CMS. And so the entirety of the book is available on foundingsales.com in Squarespace, searchable, like it's free. You just, you have to reg, but you know, it's, it's just like sitting right there. So it's because it's written like in um, chronological order. And so like, it's not really like a page turner. <laughs> We're like, oh, this is fascinating. I should like if if you're a founder and you're just starting out, you probably don't need to read the sales hiring chapter. But when you get there two years later, that's the point at which you want to do it. So that's why we put it online so that people could like search across it and like come back to things like, oh yeah, I need to refresh our deck. Like, where was that again? And you can like search, search for it. I'm curious, are, are there specific, because it was written a couple of years ago. Was it 2020 it was published or before that? I couldn't. Yeah, I mean, I wrote it over yeah. like four years from like 2014 or 2013 through, um, I think it was like 2014 through like 2017. Um, but yeah, it was like written over over that period. And like for the longest time, it was actually talking about MVPs. It was just a series of uh, Google Docs that were like interhyperlinked. And so it was so funny, like as I was writing it, we had like an index of it and there was like all these chapters. And then there were like the next chapters that hadn't been written yet. And you would see like all the like anonymous emus and whatever in the Google doc sitting there. And like, you'd click into like one of the chapters and there'd be like a bunch of like other anonymous aardvarks and foxes as well, like reading it. Um, but yeah, it was definitely like something that got bit, like it was a work in progress for a really long time before it actually got like published. Yeah. And I'm curious, like, are there any tactics or chapters that are maybe a little outdated now that you wish you could go back and, and rewrite? Like, cause I mean, sales and tech evolve so quickly, like, yeah, anything come to mind? I actually, I think I would actually disagree with that. Like, I don't, I don't think that sales um, evolves quickly, at least like the fundamentals. Like, I think that like there's some tactics around the edges. Like there's, there's like screenshots of like LinkedIn sales navigator in there that like, so it doesn't look like that anymore, but like the core notion of like, there are databases, they are full of humans that like align with the personas of people that you should be selling to. You should go into those databases in order to find those humans and then seek to engage them. Whether that's like LinkedIn Sales Navigator or Apollo or like Zoom Info or whatever, like the vendors may end up changing, but the core concept of there are humans in the world. They probably, they, they have your need. You should find them and then get in front of them and then pursue persuasively talk with them about why they have your need and like, or why they have this need and why your solution solves that, that really hasn't, hasn't changed. So like, you know, I do need to go back through there and like, like gussy up, like the, you know, the vendors, like, I think as an example in the like baby, like in the CRM section, where we're talking about CRM. I think I talk about like pipe drive and like close IO as being like good baby uh, CRMs alongside HubSpot. At this point, like HubSpot is the canonical like baby CRM for, for SMBs. And so like that needs to be like, that needs to be glowed up a little bit, but the notion of like having a CRM or like keeping track of your deals, that's definitely something that like, you know, that's, that's something that's like, you know, time immemorial, whether it was a piece of paper that had all your deals on it and like the status of it, or like a local version of that on your machine or like Siebel CRM, like with a server client uh, architecture or a Salesforce or HubSpot, like it's all the kind of the same, like turns out keeping track of like 50 concurrent deals, your brain is not set up for that. You should probably write it down. Yeah. And I love how the book starts with like, you know, establish your narrative, right. And your positioning and then take all of that and and use that to kind of create all the marketing assets, right. And the decks and the PDFs and stuff. And I mean, and as a former marketer, that really speaks to the way I think about it. And that's foundational. That'll like never change over time. You have to nail the narrative and the positioning before you kind of go do all the other things, right. That's that foundational piece that, you know, evolves no matter what company you're, you're doing. Yeah, for sure. 
I'm curious, like, how do you know when you're ready to start hiring a sales team outside of, right, the founder just doing sales? Like, that's something I'm, you know, struggling with to a doc. Like, you know, I was doing sales for a while. We had a bunch of customers. We have one AE now. But I'm, yeah, I don't know. It's something I'm always thinking about is like, what's the right moment? How do you let go? How do you balance kind of that transitionary mm -hmm. phase where you're going from just the founder to like the baby sales team? Yeah. And I think that there's a, um, I, I do a presentation on this called um, it's like if you if you Google it it's it's like founding sales like or, or founder led selling like maturity stages um, there's like a deck that's available online there's a bunch of like recordings on YouTube of me like doing it at different conferences but like there's this transition period between the founder doing repeatable sales like what that means is the reason why you do repeatable sales is because what you want to, there's kind of two things. Like one, like, will anyone buy this thing? And that's like non-zero, that's like not repeatable. That's like existence proof, <laughs> right? Like, will, will so, someone, anyone buy this thing and then get utility out of it? Because like, you can, you'd be surprised. Like you get good at selling and you can sell something. You can sell people the promise, but if they don't use it, it's like it's actually not delivering on the utility. Uh, Jocker Van Ukui from Winning by Designs has this great phrase for this nice little terse phrase, which is recurring revenue is the result of recurring impact, right? So like you got to make sure that there's recurring impact and what that's usually signified by ongoing usage and then ongoing like impact of like delivery of the value that was promised. Okay, so let's imagine we have like, we do that initially, the kind of like, existence proof of that so then the next thing would be like the reason why it's important not to be like declare victory after one customer or two customers or whatever and be like all right we're done let's hire 10 sales reps or whatever is because like there's still a bunch of rough edges right like a bunch of sharp edges and so by by doing multiple repetitions it's kind of like when you're making the recipe is a good metaphor for this like okay cool now i'm gonna like like ooh, this turned out good the first time let's let's do it again Ooh, i broke it didn't work the second time um, or ooh man ran out of this ingredient or ooh man like actually this order is off ooh man and so the, literally the only way that you figure that out is by doing repetition 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 repetitions and so the um, the crux of knowing like when it's time to get another like chef alongside you if you will another line cook alongside you is when you can see that you can repeatedly sell a deal um in a like there is a recipe like when it comes out of the oven like the souffle doesn't fall right um and it like reliably it reliably tastes good and so the way that that works in sales is like it's like win rates like if you have a repeatable win rate of like anywhere like 15 20 25 percent where you know the you know if if one out of five of your first meetings turns into a deal it's pretty solid Right. Um, and so now what um, and the only way you're going to know that that's the case is if you do 50 at bats to get 10 customers. Right. And so while you're doing those at bats, you're, you're like, oh, man, you know what? People get confused when I talk about this slide. I need to fix the slide or like, oh, maybe I'm actually going to change the order of the deck or like mm, the demo flows. And so then you get it to the point where you're like, OK, this is pretty tight. So if I know that like 10, like if, if 10 new opportunities come into the pipe, probably going to close one or two of them. At that point, now you say, say OK, great. This now feels like it's pro it's packaged or packageable such that another line chef can kind of sit alongside me. And they can start working with these raw ingredients and see if they can make a souffle, right? And that, that's like kind of the point at which you you do it. So like the worst case, like the the failure modes here are, are one having never even like cooked it yourself, like that's a disaster. Um, two, not enough, right? Like all right, cool. Like I've closed two deals. It's like you know, cool. Yeah, that was your mom and your aunt, right? Like that's not valid. Um, and so the, the rule of thumb I like to say is like when, you, and this is kind of contingent on average selling price, but if you get to like 10 or 20, and this is like software that costs like 10, 20, 30, 40, $50,000. Um, if you get to like 10 or 20 customers that are like reliably getting to success, um, and are referenceable, like referenceables are like a really important indicator because they're like, yeah, you know what? I gave you $20,000 and I got like $100,000 of value out of this. And like, I will tell anyone 
about that, like that's a good indicator. Like referenceability is really important because people are like, yeah, this is great. It's like a really wonderful fair trade. If you can get to like 10 or 20 customers, like close 10 or 20 customers who are super juiced, um, now you're at the point where like, all right, let's let's add. And importantly, I don't want to add five line chefs. Maybe I add two line chefs next to me. Right. And now, and now, you know, and then, and then you're onto a new stage because now your, your responsibility is to get those line chefs to success, right. And getting them to the point where they can reliably make the souffle as well as you can. Right. And what does that phase look like? Are you, are they shadowing you on calls? Are you making PDFs and slides for them? Like, how can you sort of support your, you know, the, your fellow line cooks to keep cooking that souffle? Well, so and that's why doing it really repeatedly yourself is so important is because what you're doing is as you're making assets for yourself, you are making the assets that are for those future line chefs, right? Um, and so, yeah, I talk about this quite a bit in the in the chap, the sales hiring and onboarding and management chapters in um, in founding sales. But one, it's, you know, onboarding effectively. Um, if you have call recording soft, so first of all, the assets should be there. The collateral should be there. Um, if you are, and this is like where a lot of founder sellers kind of like skimp on, on documentation. Um, but like having a demo flow in your head is like not great. Like you should have it documented, even if it's just like bulleted out, um, having a deck, um, one of the, I, I have some, a bunch of. Uh, I have a presentation on, it's like a presentation on sales presentations or whatever, but like making sure that you have a sales deck that you yourself are using, even if it's like a discovery deck that's like largely for framing, um, like having those assets ready. And then what you do is you just train up on those where ideally you've recorded a bunch of these, the, like you have, you know, Chorus or Gong or any like Fathom, any of these like free options that are available um, that just kind of follows you around, around and like records all these things for you. And then you certify your, um, your staff on them. This is actually something where, um, where a lot of folks really struggle is I don't want to micromanage. Micromanage is like the dumbest word ever. Like, Oh, oh you mean you don't want to manage? Got it. Totally. <laughs> right. Oh, you know what? I just like busted my ass for a year, figuring out exactly the right order that these deals should go in. And like what a, like what the discovery questions are and what the you know and and what the the presentation script looks like and the slides look like and the demo script. But you know what? You just do you. You do you, right? Like just you know, just go crazy. No, that's like terrible. And um, the same way that like you know when someone joins like the New England Patriots or whatever, it's just like you know what? Just run. You just go ahead and run that route and run those plays however you want. No, no, no. Here's our playbook. We're gonna onboard it. You know, we're gonna like see how you run these like run these routes. Cool. We're gonna do a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of uh, run throughs of making the souffle, and we're gonna and we're gonna taste it each time. And I'm gonna sit next to you. You're gonna watch me do it a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of times. You're gonna watch the video a bunch, a bunch of times. But that's not sufficient. Then you're gonna do a bunch of fake ones where I'm the customer. We're gonna do it again and again and again and again and again until like you just have it absolutely, absolutely nailed. And then we're gonna start letting you get in front of customers and not by yourself, but with someone riding along with you. And we're gonna do that a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of times. And then finally, you're gonna be at the point where you can do this on your own. But like takes a long time and you, you can't do that if you don't have the documentation, if you don't have the recipe there, if you, and then moreover, if you don't actually authenticate that the person can reliably execute that recipe, any of the, if like, if you don't do any of these steps, you're opening yourself up for like all sorts of terrible hurt. Yeah, I definitely made the, the micromanager mistake at Doc where I was like, I, I hired someone, they're doing great, it seemed to be going well, and I took a, a little bit too far of a step back. And then, you know, sales started to slow a little bit. And it was like, once I came sort of back in and more clearly defined the process and how it should go down, I was like, oh, shit, now it's actually working. You know, now it's working and it was collaborative. And actually, it wasn't didn't feel like micromanaging. Andy, our sales rep, like, loved it, right? You could collaborate with me. We could mm -hmm. figure out what, what was working, what wasn't, and really clearly define it. And once we sort of wrote down each little step of our process, then I was like, oh, this is actually simpler than we thought. And we, you know, it started working. It's, it's funny how that all works. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yep. It, the, the written word, the written word, it's been helpful for like, you know, thousands of years. Yeah, 
exactly. Except this time, I think it was more of a, a fig jam file where I had the flow chart. But yeah, you know, we're more mm-hmm. the same thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, so um, even earlier, uh, hieroglyphics. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. Uh, I'd love to switch gears and start talking about Atrium, which is the company mm-hmm. you you co-founded and you're at now. Mm-hmm. And Atrium's a you know data driven sales management platform. I think I got got that right. And I'd love to understand kind of like the early days of Atrium and kind of the the founding story there. What was the product like? Why'd you decide to start it? Can you give us kind of what it was like? Yeah, for sure. And I think where Atrium really kind of came out of a lot of the um, experience that we had at Talent Bin, where you know, when I was an, our initial seller, and then as soon as we started having incremental salespeople, um, instrumenting, like the thing that you were talking about earlier, like, hey, it took a step back, and then things started to get weird, but I didn't quite know why, right? And so when you have like one or two reps, like you can be on calls, you can like listen to calls, you can like you're sitting next to them, you kind of like to extend the cooking metaphor, it's just like, oh, I'm going to sample this as like, you know, as your as your things are coming out of the out of the kitchen. But once you get to like 10 reps or 20 reps or whatever, like you can't like taste all the food, so to speak, right? Instead, like you have to use metrics for that. Um, and then this was like a key insight at uh, at Talent Bin. One of the one of my favorite business books is one is a book called The Goal by Eli Goldratt. Um, it's a manufacturing um, it's written as a novel, but it's like a manufacturing um, re- research, like Toyota Lean manufacturing um, uh, concepts uh, explained as a, as a novel. It came out in the 80s. And, um, but essentially what it, like, what it opened my eyes to, um, and I actually read it when I was you know, in high school, um, when I started like, managing a sales organization, I was like, oh, this is just like a factory got it right like we've got these various assembly lines we have to just like instrument like things coming in like into the process and then like all the steps along the way like how many things are moving along where are things falling out where the conversion rate er issues are like just you know are are our our machines our reps are like doing sufficient quantity and quality of of like work in order to like move things along and so we did a pretty good job of that at Talent Bin. But then when Talent Bin was acquired by Monster, um, it was kind of funny because we, I, I anticipated, because like Monster had like a thousand person sales organization. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like, well, I'm sure they do it like way better than we do. Um, and it was just like, no one had any idea what was going on. Like, it was all like anecdata. data. It's like, oh, I'm hearing X, Y, Z. Like no one used the CRM. Um, and, and so what it kind of opened my eyes to is that most organizations do a very poor job of instrumenting the quantity and quality of selling behavior that's happening by their reps metrically, right? Like call recording is all well and good. And like people tell themselves a story that like managers listens to, listens to calls. They don't. Um, all that stuff's cool, but really the, the way to understand what's going on with a rep, a set of reps, many reps, many teams, et cetera, is through instrumentation. And like, all the technologists who might be listening to this are like, oh yeah, duh. You mean like observability software, like Datadog? Obvi. But that's not <laughs> most like sales organizations don't necessarily think that way. Um, and the good news is like the sales operations function exists to kind of help with this. Um, but they historically, like the tool chain that they they've used for that has been more like generalist horizontal, kind of like BI, like Looker or Tableau, which are great for analysts, but if you like hand a sales manager or a sales leader who come from sales land, right? They're great communicators. They're super, you know, super empathetic, like, you know, great listeners, um, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the jokes that we like to say is like most sales managers and leaders don't come from the math department. So if you hand them like a grid of like 12 tiles on a Tableau dashboard, they're going to be like, thanks, man. Like what the hell is going on here? close the tab and then they're going to go back to like, let's talk about deals, 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 deals. And so the whole idea behind Atrium was like, how can we democratize um, the power of management by metric at the manager level, at the second level leader level, at the third level leader level. Um, and, and this is actually the, the, the rise of AI in the last like six months, like large, large language model AI has really helped democratize that even more so because the way that Atrium works, it takes like five minutes to set up an account. Like there's, you know, you, there's a read only connection with your CRM. Poof, we calculate like a hundred plus metrics out of the box through all sorts of like smart mapping and kind of like, you know, um, like learnings over the last like three or four years 
And then we have all the statistical anomaly detection on top of that. All that stuff is really great. Um, but even that like was too much for or like a bridge too far for some sales managers. And so literally just like breaking it down and just like explaining it to someone in English, like, hey, by the way, like this rep right here, like he, he has a bookings problem that's coming from this win rate issue right here. And his win rate issue is coming from the fact that he's got a lower conversion rate at a proposal as compared to all the different reps. And like literally just like bulleting that out for a manager, like turning it into a narrative for them. So they're like, got it. I should bird dog proposals, like proposal stage with this guy. Or like, hey, you got this rep over here. Turns out like he's got a pipeline hygiene issue. You can see it based on like his untouched ops and his stuck ops right here. Um, his activity is not low. Like he's doing a bunch of activity. It seems like it's just mis misdirected. You should put time on his calendar that is specifically for pipeline cleanup twice a you know, twice a week. And this is the sort of stuff that like now you can do with large language models, which whereas previously like a year ago or like two years ago, we would be showing people these statistics and like asking them to read the tea leaves for themselves. And now we've actually got, been able to go a lot further in like reading the tea leaves and providing recommendations, which is great because like at the end of the day, you know, like I, I, I have a whoop on right now. I don't know if you're like an Apple watch guy or, or what have you, but like using data to like, like to measure behavior and then provide recommendations is really powerful. The quite, but like if that's only something that like very analytical people can do, that's a very small subset of like the general population. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's an amazing story of like how you can basically just turn math into real action and real insights that people can actually go and impact. Okay, not only the holistic sales and words. Well, I guess that's where the LLM stuff comes in, right? Because then now you're and actually. Words. There's like a paragraph. I see you sharing it a lot on Twitter, right? Where, okay, there's a whole paragraph of actions that people can go take when they realize that, okay, close rates. I, I think this, like this is like a key insight for us. And like, I, I think this is why it's really important that like founders stay super close to the product and also like give themselves enough maker time in order to kind of like do this stuff. It's like, um, I, I had this realization that like humans, for the most part, like are, are they think in words and they're programmed by words. Like as a marketer, you you know this, right? Um, anyone who's watched Mad Men knows this. Um, and we then this has been the case for you know hundreds of thousands of years. And so like the abstraction between like numerics, like analytics, and like words is like pretty substantial for a lot of people. And so that was like there was a key like aha moment like nine months ago where it's like, hey, it seems like we can probably transform a lot of these facts that we are creating. Um, and, and like these insights that we're manufacturing that then, you know, f for a large proportion of our, our, our audience, they were like, like, okay, cool. Thank you for the anomalies here, but what does this mean and what should I do about it? Um, and, and like now being able to turn that into something that they can like natively speak, which is like words and stories, and then providing a recommendation. Like I said earlier, like, oh, there is a pipeline hygiene problem right here. Um, here's why, and this is what you ought to do about it. Now, managers are just like, oh my goodness, thank you, right? I imagine building a platform like this is kind of hard, right? Like you're ingesting all this data, then you're trying to connect those data to specific insights and like everyone's CRM is very messy, right? Data hygiene is always a problem. Like, I don't know, how, do, how does that sort of work behind the scenes? And is it, I guess, a really clear that like, okay, this data point is always going to map back to this action or this problem that you're going to surface back or because I assume some things can be related to multiple things. Yeah. How do you think about this, this challenge? But I, the way to think about it is just the way that like a human would think about it. Right. And this is where um, like we part of our sales motion is what, what we call the, the marriage counseling between sales operations and sales management um, where like when you're instrumenting a sales organization, the, it's not a factory. It's like a factory, but it's not a factory. And the reason why is because the machines are not reliable. The machines are messy. They're people. And the reason why your sell the reason why you need those messy sellers is because they're interfacing with prospects who are also messy. Right? So you got like messy on that side and you got messy on this side. And so what that means is that doesn't mean that it's impossible to instrument. It just means that it's not deterministic necessarily. And this is where a lot of sales operations, people kind of get like, especially like BI teams get like super like wrapped around the axle as they're like, but it needs to be like accurate within like, you know, 99%, 99.9% .9 
you know, accuracy. It's like, no, it doesn't. We're talking about humans, man. Like all we're trying to figure out is like, yeah, like, Oh, well, you know, I think Bob has an activity problem. I think he's doing less activity than everyone else. Oh, well, like this meeting right here, that was actually with his wife. He took his wife out to dinner, right? And she has a MuleSoft uh, email address and that was on his calendar. Yeah, totally. But he has 50% fewer meetings than everybody else. So he, <laughs> you're right. It's like, hey man, it's like, cool. I, I'm glad he had a date night, but he's got 50% fewer meetings than his peers or like 30% fewer meetings than his peers. Like, oh, okay. Like, um, and I think that there's, there's just like, part of this is that industry changes at the, um, at the pace of like the humans who can change. And you're seeing this right now where, I mean, we have a bunch of um, fairly large organizations that we work with um, where the sales leaders who are like, you know, 40 something, 50 something, you know, maybe in the early 60s or whatever, they're like, they're now transitioning from, they came up in an era where there was no data, so they didn't need a data muscle. And now they're kind of like realize, like A, the like the old, the old fogies are like realizing like, hey, I, I probably do need this. Plus I see all the, the guys on the PGA tour, they're wearing those whoop things, right? And like, and I know that I golf a lot. And so I like, I pay attention to my fairways and regulation and my greens and regulation and like, you know, all these different stats. And I, I watch that movie Moneyball, right? And so like, that's kind of transitioning over time. And then of, of course, like then you have the younger folks who have grown up in a data native environment, right? Where like, they, like they've been on Strava forever or they like, what have you. And so I think it's like, that is transitioning over time. So people like are now let, like more open to that. But that does, just because they're open to it doesn't necessarily mean that they have the, the, the skill profile to be able to do it, but at least they're not resistant to it any, anymore. I'd love to know, like, what does the actual sales process look like for Atrium itself? Because, like, it, it must be pretty challenging to go convince, okay, yeah, you're like the BI guys who are probably a, a pain sometime, and then you have to go convince, I guess, the sales leaders that they need to be more data-driven. Like, how do you think about your own sales process how do you kind of convince people that okay they need to move towards this more like the money ball revolution for sales that atrium is helping power yeah um it, it actually isn't hard so we have a two-legged sales process a lot of organizations a lot of a lot of vendors have a two-legged sales process um especially the higher that you get it at this point like icp for us is like larger than like it, it more than like 30 sellers like 20 or 30 sellers um, we have historically had organizations that have had a lot, a lot fewer sellers. But at this point, one of the things that we've observed is like the problem that we solve gets big, like gets more and more and more acute the larger that you get. It gets like more and more acute, like not linearly. It becomes like, you know, uh, it becomes much more muscular the bigger that you, the bigger that you get, and the more like layers of uh, managerial abstraction. Um, the managers actually don't take a lot of convincing um, because they they feel this pain point very. Con concretely. Uh, and I think that that's actually a really important thing um, from a sales process standpoint is to like figure out who's got the biggest burning pain and you can start with them. But then usually if you have a two-legged sales process, um, you can't just like show up to the other part of the, like the other part of the conversation and say like, Hey, these guys have this problem and like you need to solve it for them. You also have to figure out what their pain point is as well. So in our case, um, you know, sales management leadership, and um and operations are largely the the two people who participate in these conversations. Sales management's frustration is around um, access to data in a in a simplified format that actually is accessible to them, um, because like they're used to being handed like twenty four tiles on a Tableau dashboard that like six of them are like broken, and they're just like <laughs> terrible like. On, like I just needed to know how many customer facing meetings my team reps had last week. Like Jesus, guys, um, and and so like that's ends up not being all that terribly difficult. Um, manager uh, second level leaders um, recognize that their managers um, are are not being enabled to manage my metric in an effective way. And then moreover, the second level leaders also are like even if like maybe those managers are being provided with the right resources. Um, they're oftentimes frustrated by the level of actual like managerial application, like execution that's being done there. It's like, um, they're like, now what? So that's, that's pretty easy. Um, on the sales operations side, um, the 
oftentimes you can have a some sometimes you can have like a little bit of like a not invented here syndrome situation where it's like well, what are you talking about like i provide all these like reports and dashboards for these guys like what what the heck man it's like you know like i like it's not my fault it's like no, no no bless it's not your fault man totally like but but these folks are not you right like you know what did what did you do under oh econ you did econ under oh oh biochem you did bio oh you, you oh you started your career at accenture right you know ms vp of of sales operations cool like let's have a little bit of empathy for our sales managers here and our sales leaders here one two also like you know how many like dashboard requests or like report requests do you guys get in your organ like in your sales ops organization oh you're being eaten alive by them constantly and then by the time you hand them back like the person's moved on that sounds really frustrating for you right and then more of the assets that you provide them they're not even looking at like do you guys do that interpretation for oh you have one analyst who does all that interpretation for them like Got it. Okay, cool. How frequently do they do that? Oh, they they do. They spend the entire quarter doing QBRs for the last quarter because they're doing interpretation. Oh, okay, got it. Right. And how and that that analyst resource is one hundred twenty thousand dollars, and you still only did, like do interpretation for your managers once a quarter. Got it. Anyway, like you just need to make sure that you're, like you're and as a marketer, you get this right. Like. Um, I'm sure when you guys were doing this at Lattice, there was like the line manager, there was the employee, there was the HR person. They all have like, just got to make sure that like you got to talk track and slides and like that, that, you know, addresses their, their relative, their relative issues. And so like when we're selling to these organizations, typically we enter through the, um, we enter through sales leadership or, or sales operations. They come in the top of the funnel, initial discovery conversation that is like framed for them. Sales leader is going to look a little bit different than the sales operations one, as we just kind of talked about. And then we see like, if they have that pain point, if they recognize that they have that pain point. Um, and then, you know, because we've gone, we've gone from a, like a, more of a bottoms up sale to more of like a top down sale, as this is like more recognized, um, pain, you know, we're, we do kind of more buying discovery initially to say like, Hey, is this like an initiative in the next six months? Or is this like just something that's like below the line? This is like a priority five problem or is this like a priority like two or three problem? So that's, that's pretty much it. And then like, it's super easy to turn on an atrium account, um, takes like five minutes, but for a lot of these larger organizations, they have, like security processes and whatever we still get organ Like you'd be shocked. We still get like public organizations that are like the VP of sales office is like, yeah, let's turn it on here. <laughs> We're like, all right, share your screen. <laughs> like, great. <laughs> um, but like we will do that. But then, and then like we progress to like a, you know, a very abbreviated, um, pilot process and what have you. But in general, people are like blown away by the interpretation of things that otherwise like they wouldn't see, especially with the, the AI stuff. It's like, it's absolutely bananas, right? Like you, you have like all these anomalies, like, cool. You want to see what's going on with the same click and just like, you know, the LLM writes out like, all right, cool. Like these are the top three problems. These are the things you might think about this. Here's like, here are the reps to be worried about. Here are the reps who you should go give high fives to. And then like, here's a cliff's notes on the eight reps on, on this team. It's like, oh my God, that was a sales operations analyst just like did a, like a custom, like, you know, dossier for me. And it took like, you know, 45 seconds. Crazy. Let's, we got to show this to the CRO. You're right. We do have to show this in yeah. CRO. That's exactly what you want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with you, Frank. Yeah. Let's expedite that conversation immediately. Yeah. yeah. Do you have Do you have their calendar in front of you? Yeah. It's <laughs> uh, too funny. I'd love to. I'd love to spend a moment talking about the top of the funnel because I think Atrium's growth strategy is pretty interesting. I mean, you clearly have a great personal brand and have given a lot back to the sales community with the book, and then also with the community, right? Modern. Sales Sales pros, which I know is distinct from from Atrium, but also I assume related in, in some ways. So yeah, I would love to kind of hear about that strategy and how that's paid off for you. Um, yeah, for yeah, your I, and yeah, I think that like I mean, we did a lot of community marketing. I know that you worked did a bunch of community marketing at Lattice as 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 well. Resources for humans, if I recall correctly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think that, like the the important thing to understand is like as as an entrepreneur, um, as a marketer, what have you, is that like your problem like your solution and the problem that it's associated with like sits within a larger you know uh ecosystem stew of problems and so you know if you can capture the attention of that audience um 
and all the different problems, like all the different problems they have, then you potentially can be well situated to, you know, to be the thing that they think about when when the problem that you solve pops up. The problem is a lot of people have like done community marketing in a pretty dumb way where they're like, oh, well, we're going to be like the, the analytics community. It's just like, eh. Or sorry, the sales analytics community is like, I don't know if that's going to raise to like the level of like, like, oh, do I really need to be in my 10th Slack group for, for that? Um, and so I think the, the, the challenge may be that like for, for some markets, the, there may already be like canonical communities that are in place. Like modern sales pros has like 35,000 sales operations, sales managers, and sales leaders um, in it. Um, I'm sure that like resources for humans has like a bajillion, like, you know, HR people in it or what have you. So just like telling yourself a story that you're going to like in- create a new community where there's already one, um, is probably a pretty tough thing to do. Um, but if, if like the, the personas that you work with don't yet have a canonical online community that can potentially, can potentially be a, um, uh, a growth a growth path for you uh for you there it's been very successful for us with atrium like um you know like modern sales pros has like it generates lots of content we work with uh, like lots and lots of different vendors like the gongs of the world the choruses of the zoom infos of the world the average of the world the sales lofts of the world the orums of the world um et cetera, et cetera. like we work with a lot of those folks and they you know, they do sessions and that are that, that people are interested in. And of course, Atrium just like layers in there with with the others as well. Yeah, I think community is such a powerful strategy. And yeah, but it's hard to do when it when it gets saturated. Like I would love to do a sales community for Doc, but it's like that's it's why would I do that, right? It's like modern sales pros exist. There's other ones that exist. And so you have to sort of find new and interesting ways to kind of build a community and a brand. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing this podcast, you know? Uh, so there, there's different ways to to go go about and do it. Um, so Atrium is obviously not the first company you've started, but I'm, I'm curious, like what's been the surprisingly hardest thing about starting Atrium? Um, I think the... The the biggest thing, I mean, I think this is like the thing that people will like that that entrepreneurs will qu- quickly learn um, is like staging of a product, right? Like, um, this is the biggest challenge that practitioners going into like starting companies that are product centric um, run into is what is the order of operations um, by which I build the the product. And it really goes back to that lean startup kind of concept of um, the, like, there's this great visual metaphor where you don't want to build, like if you want to get to a car, you don't want to build like the front left of the car and then the back left of the car and then the back right of the car and the front right of the car because the entire time you haven't been able to roll at all. If you want to build a car, instead what you want to do is you want to start with a skateboard. You want to build a skateboard first. You can roll sucks in the rain right but you can at least roll and go to the grocery store right and then you have a scooter put a little front on it a little basket now we can put groceries in it and then we get to a bike then we get to a car and so i think that that's something that's really important for founders to always come back to is like make sure that you're staging appropriately and then then the the customer is always getting utility along the way. Now that can be hard um, when you're trying to do deep technology. And and I think you you mentioned this earlier. I was talking to this SVP of sales operations for this you know 2,000 salesperson organization earlier, and he was like, man, this like this AI so we, our AI feature is called Sales Coach. He's like, this is insane. And it, and this guy's really sh- really sharp. He's like, but I can totally see how the only way you guys were able to get this was you needed to have all of that anomaly detection, the statistical anomaly detection done first. And in order to have that, you needed to have the entire metrics harness first. And in order to have that, you need to have all that mapping. One of our board members, this guy named Brett Queener, he's like, he calls it gopher guts. You gotta have all this like insane gopher guts that you guys have built over time. And so that can be tough, um, like kind of like, threading that needle and i think in our case um it took a lot longer to build the thing 
that um, we wanted to get to, to like the promised land, than than we we anticipated. Um, but I think the important thing there is like are like always being focused on like are you delivering utility as indicated by usage, NPS, referenceability, um, and kind of like stay close to that. Um, and versus you know telling yourself a story that like you're you're going into this deep build hole and and what have you and you're not actually like you don't have those signifiers of customer utility i think that can be really like that can be a recipe for disaster there but it's tough yeah no it's something i think a lot about as we build doc which is definitely trying to build a wider platform for revenue teams but it's like okay how do we pace our product bets to kind of deliver enough value to our customers to hit those revenue stone miles along the way even if we're marching towards this broader vision and yeah i don't know it's it's really it's a it's a tough puzzle but it's fun fun to try and figure out <laughs> yeah you know who's a great person to kind of like who ha like thinks really like thoughtfully about this and shares a lot of, and is funny when he does it is aaron levy the ceo of box it's because like box has been around for like, I don't know, like 12 years or something like that. And like, I'm sure 12 years ago, like they're just shipping features now that they like were, talked about 10 years ago, but like reality intervenes. And, um, and so I think, but the problem is there a really important thing is, is that you have to be alive in order to like do that thing. Right. Like, and if, and if somehow you have shipped something that nobody cared about along the way as so how you know that people care about the thing that you shipped is win rate win rate tells you whether or not they care um and then average selling price tells you the magnitude of how much they care right how big of a problem this is and then renewal rate and net retention rate like gross retention and net retention rate right net dollar retention tells you whether you actually delivered on the like win rate tells you whether or not they believe you right and like they have the pain and then ndr tells you whether or not you actually delivered on that and so if you pay attention to those things like and that's why those things have to be healthy in order for you to have earned the right to continue to to like live another day and either a use like the revenue that is coming in from your organization to then fund that future or persuade some investor like hey look isn't this an amazing skateboarder? Isn't this an amazing scooter? People really like it. You know, um, they will like it a lot more and we'll be able to access a lot bigger total addressable market if we are able to enclose it in some sort of capacity such that like the rain doesn't get on people. But, right, but like you got to make sure that people are actually like riding the scooter, like want to ride the scooter and, and are actually riding the scooter in the meantime to like have earned the right to build the bicycle to on your way to building the golf cart, on your way to building the car. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of like what Elon did with the, starting with the Roadster and then moving into more, you know, broader available cars, right? Like Model S and, and all that. Yeah, got to mm -hmm. start with the wedge, right? That's that's how it works. Ideally, a high margin edge. Yeah. <laughs> right. A high margin wedge, right? Um, that you can then use to to then get to the to the next thing. I'd love to end today's conversation kind of talking about the future of, of sales tech. I think there's like a lot of interesting things going on, especially with like these big CRM adjacent players, right? Gong, Clary, ZoomInfo, Outreach are all buying up different companies and kind of build, trying to build these platforms. Like, yeah, what's your take on these moves and what's your, how do you think about sort of like, I don't know, future of sales tech more broadly? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the, the consolidation of I'm calling them like, digital i'm i figure out what gartner called them but like they're essentially digital sales like aggregators right and they all kind of came from a different place of strength like gong and chorus started out with call recording but once you have the call information you can like do some judgment around deals so now we want to have like deal functionality um and then of course like sales loft and outreach started as um sales development like essentially email automation. Oh no, 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 this is sales engagement. No, it isn't, it's marketing automation light. Um, and and like that was cool and that was super useful for the sales development function. Um, and then they have started to accrete other functionality on there because it turns out the ability to send email is a core behavior of sellers. Turns out that having calls and like managing deals is a core behavior of, of sellers. So those folks have, and then, like making judgments based on that, like a forecast is a core behavior of a sales organization. That's where Clary started out. 
And so I think what what's happening is like all those folks are kind of consolidating into like a unified workflow interface for the revenue human. Um, and you can kind of see this where even like the the SDR centric organization, so like Outreach and Gong, sorry, Outreach and Sales Loft, who started out as kind of like sales development centric, um, they've been working their buns off to get into uh, AE land, AM land, CSM land, because that's, you know, 70% or 80% of the humans in sales land have those roles. And that's why what you've observed is like Gong just added a, a capability called uh, Gong Engage that's like mid-funnel sales engagement or mid-funnel email automation, but again, primarily focused on the AE, AE, AM, uh, CSM type person, not really the like marketing automation light piece. So I think what's going to happen is those folks for the next like two or three years are really going to be focused very heavily on filling in their respective gaps. Um, so like Clary just bought uh, Groove, right? Because like, like, okay, cool. We have the ability to measure and roll up opportunities here, but what about like taking actions on those opportunities? Oh, well, how do we take actions with email, right? Because we're digital sellers. Got it. Well, we'll just like buy this Groove. So I think that like the next two or three years is really going to be that in a very meaningful way. Um, well, we think a lot about like where we live in that land. Um, we're very much manager centric. Right. So like the manager is the person who really cares about Atrium. The leader is the person who cares about Atrium. And so we're very heavily focused on like you know, facilitating better management through metric and kind of like letting managers, SDR managers, AE managers, second level leaders, et cetera, take action on um, on managerial behaviors that they should be be doing there, which is, you know, a little orthogonal to that. Like those folks may start getting into that space, but the good news is like now that they're all like filling in each other's gaps and uh, and what have you, probably a lot of their engineering resources are going to be going to that versus like manager stuff. But, you know, we'll see how, how it shakes out. Yeah. I mean, it seems like everyone's competing for like the CRO's attention and how can we just give them like an amazing data suite and help them get their forecast, you know, better while actually also, you know, tying the different actions in their platform back, back up into that. But yeah, we'll see how it goes. I think doc is actually pretty well positioned to be a good adjacent platform to these, 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 these new platforms that are being built because none of them are sort of touching the the world that, that we're playing in. So I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. It won't, it won't be boring. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great note to end it. Thank you so much, Pete. If, if people want to follow up with you, reach out, have questions about founder-led sales, where's the best uh, social media channel to find you? Uh, I am very easily findable on LinkedIn and Twitter or X, whatever it's called. Like, there is only one Peter Kazanji in the United States, as, lo as far as I can tell. So if you just Google me and like, don't worry about spelling my last name wrong, because Google will autocorrect it for you, um, the, the, the top links will probably be me. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's a wrap on another episode of Grow & Tell. If you enjoyed the show, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform, or find every episode at growandtellshow.com. I'm your host, Alex Krakow. Thank you for listening.